Roger, if I ask the question, what things really exist to most scientists, they would say, the physical world, that's it. Why'd you ask me such a silly <laughs> question? Yes, I suppose they would. Um, well, I think often people take the view that, that there is a, another kind of reality, which is the real, mental reality. Um, certainly philosophers might take yes. that view. And some would even regard the mental, mental world as being, in some sense, primary, that yes. the physical world is somehow to be thought of as a construct from mentality. I don't particularly like that view, uh, but in my view, you have to think of a third one. I'm sometimes accused of being not just a dualist, but actually a trialist, which is even worse, <laughs> you see, from some points of view. But uh, I think it's just a useful way of, of uh, talking about things. In particular, mathematics seems to have its own kind of existence. Um, it's very important in understanding the physical world that our way of um, describing the physical world certainly at its most precise has to do with mathematics and there's no getting away from that. And that mathematics has to have been there uh, s since the beginning of time. Uh, it, it has an, uh, an eternal existence, timelessness really. It doesn't have any location in space, it doesn't have any location in time. Uh, some people would take it not to have any location or not any existence at all. But it's hard to talk about science, really, without a, a, a giving ma mathematics some kind of reality because that's how you describe your theories in terms of mathematical structures. It has this also, also this relation to mentality because we, we certainly have access to mathematical truths. But I think it's useful to think of the world as not being a creation of our minds, because if we do, then how could it have been there before we were around? Somehow, the, if the world has a, a, a being obeying mathematical laws with extraordinary precision since the beginning of time, well, there were no human beings and no conscious beings of any kind around then. So how can, how can the, the math mathematics have been the creation of, of minds and still have been there controlling the universe? So I think it's very uh, valuable to think of this platonic mathematical world as having its own existence. So let's allow that and say that there are three different kinds of existence, maybe others, but three kinds of existence. The normal physical existence, the mental existence, which seems to have, a, in some sense, even greater reality. It's what we directly are aware of, what we directly perceive. And the mathematical world, which seems to be out there, in some sense, conjuring itself into existence. It's, it has to be there, in some sense. Um, and then there's the relationship between these three worlds, which I regard as all three of them as somewhat mysterious, or very mysterious. So I think these, I sometimes refer to this as three worlds and three mysteries. And mystery number one is how is it that the physical world does, in fact, accord with mathematics, not just any old mathematics, but very sophisticated, subtle mathematics, to such a fantastic degree of precision. So that's mystery number one. Mystery number two is how is it that when you have physical structures of the right kind, and here I'm referring very specifically to human, living human, wakeful, healthy <laughs> brains, probably many other animals, I would say, also have this quality of mentality. And somehow it's evoked when the structures have the right, have the right character, whatever that is. So there is... Um, mentality seems to have this deep relation to certain kinds of physical structures. And then... That's mystery number two. That's mystery number two. And mystery number three has to do with our access to the world of mathematics. And why it's a mystery is, is perhaps not so clear, but it's something that you certainly can't um, describe in terms of purely computational activity. There's something outside that involved in in our appreciation of mathematics. Even, even just knowing what the, the natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, I could say that, you see, and you can explain to a child and you can have Sesame Street <laughs> things with different things and, and they get the idea. They know what they're talking about. They know what numbers are. But yet you can't characterize simply by axiomatic procedures what the natural numbers are. There's theorems in logic to say that. Mm. 
Yet how do you know what they are if you can't describe in a finite set of rules what these numbers are? So it's, it's, uh, there is a mystery there, too. That's mystery number three. There's another feature about this, which is that in each case, it's only a small part of one world which encompasses, seemingly, the entirety of the next world. So, okay, it's only a little bit of mathematics. Okay, a very subtle and beautiful and powerful part of mathematics, but there's that whole world of mathematics. If you look at any mathematical journal, pure mathematical journal, it's full of things have absolutely no relevance to physical activity. Okay, maybe the odd thing turns out to have, but most of it, there seems to be no relation to physical reality. And that's not the point of it. You do it because you're interested in mathematics for its own sake. So it's a small part of the mathematical world which seems to encompass the behavior of the physical world. And it's a very small part of the physical world which seems to evoke mentality. Okay, there are far more rocks and things, (laughs) dead planets around, than there are conscious brains around. So it's only a very small part of that. And it has to be organized in a very subtly and sophisticated way to give rise to mentality, whatever it is. And it's only a small part of our mental activities which relate to mathematics. I think most non-mathematicians would appreciate that more <laughs> than mathematicians. But even mathematicians are most of the time doing thinking about other things. So it's only a small part of our mentality. So I like to draw this picture in almost a paradoxical way, you see. Each world is a small part of it which seems to be... Encompass the total of the other. Right, of, of the next one as you go around. Okay, there are some prejudices of mine involved in drawing the picture that way, but, but it seems to be give you a good feeling. Now, the typical scientific response to that would say, okay, the mental world is just an expression of the physical brain, and so it's, uh, it's an artificial phenomena, and it does, it's not real, it's just something that's, that's evoked by the, by the, uh, by the physical brain. And, the, and mathematics is very nice, but it's something that human beings have invented to sort of describe the physical world. So there really is only one world, the other two are kind of derivative or imaginary. Well, you see, you could take that view, or to a mathematician you might take that the mathematical world somehow is, <laughs> is, is the one, because somehow it has to be there, you see, it's... It sort of creates itself out of nothing. You see. Mm. And, and it has to be there. And then the physical reality, you might think, has its source in there. Or you might say, well, no, no, it's mentality. It's, it, it, that's where all, all our knowledge comes. That's everything ultimately has to do with our, our, our consciousness. And, and everything else is then explained in terms of it. So it isn't So clear. each one of the worlds <laughs> can, can feel its own predominance yes, over I, the others. I think that's right, yes. And it's... it's uh, I'm trying to make it look a little more kind of <laughs> symmetrical and even-handed. <laughs> uh, and to a mathematician, the math- mathematical world has a, has a kind of reality out there. It's, it's, if you like, the reality of the mathematical world, the Platonic world is an expression of, of, of the objectivity of mathematics. Mm. It's something outside any particular individual. I mean, mathematicians strive for that, you see. They don't often achieve it, you see. You, know, you can get things wrong, you can only partially appreciate what's going on. Different mathematicians have different ways of appreciating these things. But there is outside of us something there which is beyond any individual mathematician, and beyond the, the totality of all mathematicians. When you look at these three worlds, do you, you, you're obviously doing it more than metaphor, but is it, is it just as a description of reality, or is the, there some sense of real independent existence? Well, they're not independent, because each one does okay. have this relation to the next, yes. even though it's each relationship I regard as a mystery. So maybe we will understand these relationships better in the future. I don't necessarily regard this as a sort of ultimate picture. I think <laughs> that in some sense there are different aspects of reality and mm. that, that there are the true reality in some sense encompasses the whole thing. In fact, I, I tend to draw the picture in a deliberately paradoxical way. There is this, you look at it and it has this sort of feeling of one of these impossible triangles, yes, you see. Right, right, right. And, and that's deliberate. Escher-like. Escher-like. It's, it's, in, it's deliberately impossible that, that uh, there is another mystery hiding behind that, which is how all three of these worlds can somehow coexist in some deeper reality that, that's not expressed really in that picture. 